We'll do an introduction to both of us, of course, um, before we jump into the webinar. Um, so I think it's 5.02 now. So we'll go ahead and jump into this, get started. So first off, thank you all for joining, taking the time out of your Sunday evening, um, out of this three-day weekend to kind of learn a little bit more and explore this. This has been something I've been very passionate and curious about for a long time through my career. And I'm glad to finally be able to team up with someone who is far more knowledgeable and professional than I am. Um, so we'll get right into it. T-Business Sustainability is what this webinar is going to be focused on and have a kind of a unique thing about how that plays into the quality of the products we're selling in the tea industry, as well as the quality of the management. So first off, we'll kind of do a quick intro to myself. Um, my name is Jeffrey McIntosh. I am a poor tea specialist. Um, I'm also a serial entrepreneur. I've opened several tea companies here in the US. Um, and I've also been studying tea for now over 15 years with a particular focus on poor. And what you'll find me doing now in recent years is I help consumers understand the quality of the raw material they are drinking through technical analysis. And I also can do that with small businesses and I have a unique background in business where I can also help advise and consult in the industry as well. And I've been very fortunate and lucky enough to spend a lot of time in China and studied under a renowned Chinese tea master, Lo Wan Yu of Da Nang, um, and I speak fluent Mandarin. Um, and I've also been very successful at building a number of supply chains from China to here in the US. And of course, if you ever wanna reach out to me anytime, my contact information will be there as well. First, we'll talk about what is poor tea. Some of you may have heard of this term. Some of you may not be as familiar. Um, but poor tea is a unique tea that's only grown in Southwest China. It's coming from Camellia sinensis variety Assamica. Um, it's a type of tea that can be aged, right? It's almost like a drinkable antique. It can be aged indefinitely. Um, and this is one of the allures to this beautiful tea. It's almost, it has a unique fermentation aspect to it. Um, and it's usually classified as a dark tea, though because it has become so popular, poor tea has become its own category. You have raw poor, which is picked, sun-dried and pressed into like cakes, almost like a pancake, and then stored. And then you have ripe poor was developed in the 1970s, which goes on in a kind of an accelerated fermentation process known as wet piling. So inside of pour, you have two different categories, and there's quite an extensive history there. One of the oldest living pour tea trees to date is over 3,200 years old. Just imagine how old that tree is. So there's quite a unique history there. Now, in order to actually be classified as pour, the technical definition that's needed is it needs to be grown in or around the Yunnan area, Yunnan province of China, it needs to be Camellia sinensis variety Assamica. So this is not Camellia sinensis variety sensus, which grows all over the world, all over China, white tea, green tea, oolong tea, black tea is coming from that varietal. We're talking about a different varietal here known as Camellia sinensis variety Assamica. And then third, and very importantly, there has to be a special post-fermentation preparation, which allows those enzymes to stay intact in Chinese, they will also say it's called a sha qing or kill green process. You need those enzymes to stay intact so it can actually continue to age, continue to post fermentate. So these are very three necessary characteristics in order to be classified as poor. And the reason I'm talking so much about this particular tea is because that's where my specialty really lies. Um, and where do you find some of the best poor tea in the world? What does that even mean? So already poor tea is quite niche, hard to find. It can only be grown in one part of the world. But then if you break that down even more, over 97% of our pool of all the poor tea is coming from small bushes, very, very young trees. Less than 3% is coming from old growth tea trees. This is kind of go do a little bit of rollover about this um, discussion today about quality control and understanding what are you actually selling? What are you drinking? Um, I help customers understand how to use technical analysis to understand, are you indeed drinking old growth tree trees? But you can see now we're starting to kind of move up here into a more scarce commodity, right? And so I broke, I broke down the industry. Now these are very broad, but it'll kind of help you understand where the industry is at through my experience so far. You can start to see a four by two by two, little graph here. You're gonna see on the top clean and healthy. 
So, right, the more you move to the right, the more healthy and clean the tea, and then you have quality. The higher you move up, the better the quality um, the tea gets. So if we move to the bottom left category of this, you'll notice we have two layers, mass market, and then you have premium. So bottom left is tea bags. This is gonna be anything kind of machine cut, process, instant tea, tea bags, fannings, right? These in wholesale can usually go between five, $15 a kg. Now, obviously some of these prices can vary depending on where in the world you're sourcing the material, but there's been trends that have started to pick up and people and consumers have started to demand better quality teas, cleaner teas. And you can kind of move over to organic premium tea bags. And what you're gonna notice there that's gonna be a little bit different is there's gonna be certifications, right? That's gonna be involved in this process. And you may also even see organic loose leaf tea. Um, and that doesn't always mean because a tea is, has a certification, it doesn't necessarily mean the quality is better. So if we move up to the top left part, you'll see loose leaf tea. Now this is gonna be premium marketing. You're gonna have famous regions probably mentioned in some of the marketing. You're gonna have craft bend, uh, blends, tea to go, and these can get much more expensive, right? 10 to $90 a kg. And that's what you're seeing in this specialty tea market that's growing here in the West. That's actually growing quite fast. Um, last time I checked, it was in double digit growth. So there's a lot of growth in that sector. And then we're gonna move over to the far right, which is also starting to develop, but a little bit slower. It's a little bit more developed in um, Asia is quality loose leaf tea. So not only is this clean, it's extremely quality. And what you're gonna notice here, and I've discovered working with some of these more professional companies, is you have, of course, multiple certifications to really ensure that the quality is there. But then you're gonna see this line item, which is very important, called proprietary source. Proprietary source. And I have mentioned this as raw material. That means the company is controlling the raw material base. And I have noticed that has had a huge substantial importance when controlling the quality and producing the highest quality. These teas are often hand-picked, higher elevation, and older tea trees. And then one of the markets that I'm very familiar with and currently studying and working in, you'll see this little orange box on the top right. That's called secondary market and appreciation. And that's where things start to get very interested with poor, right? And then you're going to see the price point here goes from $100 to $10,000 a kg. And just a few months ago, a poor tea went for auction, went for auction in Hong Kong just 70 cakes, 337 grams for well over 1 million USD. So you can see this kind of market is starting to really kind of spread out across itself. And the reason I want to talk about this webinar and bring on our panelists today, which I'm so honored to have, Bert Hamner, is because I've often talked about, I've seen a lot of trends in the industry here in the West where people will say organic or fair trade and while these terms often usually have a lot of positive indications and good um, positive progression in the industry, what I often see is quality is lacking. Well, there's a lot of qualifications and certifications being thrown around and sustainability. The quality of the tea itself is price premium, but the quality is not there, it's lacking. And so how can we bring those two together? together? How can we make a product more green, and more sustainable through its supply chain, through the purchasing and selling to the consumer, through the education, but at the same time, ensure the quality matches that price point, right? So really kind of marriage the quality and cleanliness and sustainability all together. And that's why now I want to introduce um, our panelists, um, Bert Hamner, who's a, um, there we go. He's one of the leading pioneers in sustainable accounting. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and he's gonna come on. Um, and Bert Hammer, I'm going to let you kind of take it from here. Thank you so much for kind of helping us build a little bit more of a roadmap and kind of understanding what's kind of going on here and what does sustainability mean and how it can benefit um, small and large companies alike. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be here and I'll get this started. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> let me know if you have any problems seeing it. All right. well, uh, please, I'm pleased to join you from Seattle. Uh, we don't grow tea here, but we drink a lot of it. It's cold and, and, and dark a lot of the year, and there's nothing like a good cup. So uh, here in Seattle, I've been working for years in the, uh, with sustainability and industry. And uh, today I'm happy to join Jeffrey because we've got a new way of teaching industry in sectors 
about how to be uh, sustainable in their sector. In other words, we're not treating this as a generic issue. It's something that's very well defined within specific parts of, of industry. So background, I've been a global clean tech consultant for over 25 years. I started off with this uh, Corps of Engineers and then the Department of Ecology here in Washington State where I worked with over 112 companies to do long-term environmental plans for their sustainability and worked with the United Nations and the World Bank. And I've lived in 15 countries and worked in about 30, mostly in South America and Southeast Asia. Um, in the 1990s, I helped China set up its first national clean production technical assistance program. I've also been a professor in the Asian Institute of Management in Manila, Philippines and Universidad del Pacifico in Lima, Peru, teaching both environmental management and management accounting and operations management. Um, so here in Seattle, I've developed a new company called Sustainability CPE Inc. And we're developing webinars on the, these topics for continuing professional education. And the first of our webinars we've done is targeted towards sustainable accountants. Uh, some 350 certified public accountants have already taken the seminar, uh, the webinar to, to great um, reviews. So uh, they're a tough audience. <laughs> if you can get CPAs to tell you you're doing a good job, you're doing it right. And we're also partnering with the state accounting societies. And I bring this up in particular because when we're talking about sustainability in my business, we're talking about money and we're talking about accounting for it so that we can make the right decisions. But we're removing the philosophy and the warm and fuzzy feelings from this. This is gonna get down and technical and you'll know how to do it when we're done. So my goal today is uh, we'd like to get good reviews of this webinar because we'd like to do more of them and just like you do shopping on Amazon, you look at the reviews of the products, don't you? Uh, we also wanna find partners to produce and commercialize new content. And perhaps some of you can think of some topics you'd like to discuss. And uh, of course, we wanna encourage sustainability in all business. And we don't know where you participants have come from and what your background is, but you'll see in this part of this webinar that sustainability can be applied everywhere in any organization. And it, if you do it through the accounting and the financial management of the company, that's how it starts to really get results. So today we're gonna to talk about what is sustainability and says who, <clears throat> uh, and then sustainability standards in the tea industry. <clears throat> we'll look at some actual sustainability reports from tea industry companies and discuss ways where you can take practical steps forward uh, we invite you to discuss and connect with us at the end of this webinar, and uh, we'll have some download resources available for you. Uh, so all of the documents that I'm going to show you and topics we bring up, there's going to be a zip file where you can get everything to read for free. Okay, so who cares? Why are we here? Who should care about sustainable tea? Well, the first one, of course, is farmers. And farmers are focused on health, not only of their land, but also themselves. And I can tell you, having been out there with them, farmers don't like using pesticides. They would rather not. They know that they're not good for them, but they also need help to find better solutions for uh, pest management and for fertilizing, et cetera. They're concerned about quality, just like you are, because that's how they get a good price. They also are concerned about resource use, land use and water use in particular because these are community issues and there's often a lot of outside interests who are going to be observing and regulating that. And then of course, they're part of the community. So they want their community to be more sustainable with good practices too. Now distributors have a very specific air subject in this industry, which is transportation. So the, the distribution of tea around the world creates literally millions of tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And so better ways to move tea around are an important way to keep our climate a little bit less on the danger side. And waste management is also an issue because they have to dispose of tea throughout the system that goes bad or is out of inventory. It's not really a problem, but of course, any waste is a sign of bad management and bad technology. So it's an issue. Uh, retailers are concerned about packaging and about labeling and about product safety about supply chain insurance. So they're very, they have a number of very legal issues they have to concern about. And then finally, the customers, of course, they, are, they're, they're, they wanna know about purity and they wanna know about the supply story, what's behind the tea. And then they're looking at 
public reports to learn who is doing what and what are the benchmarks for the best performance. And the best performers get caught up by influencers. So people out here like Jeffrey, who can tell you who the experts are and what the best tea is in the sector and who's doing well. Finally, there's a number of other groups. Investors and lenders, insurers are all focused on risk management. And so sustainability is a way to manage external risks affecting the business. Regulators, of course, are, are concerned about the behavior of companies and industry, and so they want to see best practices used throughout the whole business sector. Uh, the community is concerned because they want to feel that they've got a role in understanding the risks around uh, any industry sector, and they often have strong opinions and they're advocates for good behavior. Consultants are out there, of course, and they're very important because they have specialized knowledge that can help you. Jeffrey's a consultant, for example. I'm a consultant. And one way they're very valuable is if you're doing public reporting, if you're going to put something out there to tell the public what you're doing, and what's your T story, it's a good idea to have a specialist come in and help you do that so that you don't get in trouble with it. Because uh, believe me, it's easy to say things that can get you into difficulties. Um, activists are the people that can get you into difficulties, obviously, you know, environmentalists and social, social advocates. And then finally, one last group never to forget, students are so focused on sustainability because they're concerned about the future like you and I never were when we were young. They know what's happening to the world. And if you can show your, that your business understands sustainability and is acting positively, you will get access to the best and the brightest kids. And that's a guarantee because it's happening in industry and business all around the world now. The best people can go where they want, and they do not want to be working for companies they think are unsustainable. So what is sustainability for the world? Well, very to make a long story short, starting in 1992 at the, at the United Nations Earth Summit, as they called it, the UN started working on sustainability as a concept. And for a long time, it's been very difficult to define it in a way that works for people. They came up then around about 12 years ago, they came up with a new way of thinking about it. And they've broken the concept of sustainability down into 17 goals. And these individual goals are relevant to different people in different sectors and in different industries. And the point being is that we all have specific things we're worried about and that we can do. And we don't want people looking at sustainability of the planet and feeling overwhelmed because it can get that way. You know, you look at the at all of it, you go, ah, what can I do? Here is the way to know what you can do. You can look at these goals and say, which of these are really important to me? So let's do that for the tea industry very quickly. Okay, what, what really jumps out here with the tea business? Okay, so a couple of things that are really important are uh, clean water and sanitation. If you don't have clean water, you don't have good tea. That's a pretty basic thing. Uh, but also energy is a, a critical issue because climate change, which is where we're concerned here and climate action here, uh, those are things affecting the farms. So that's gonna be affecting our future. Uh, industry and innovation and infrastructure is critical. How do we move tea around and how do we support farmers with processing? Uh, responsible consumption and production. How do we do this in a way that doesn't use too many pesticides or other chemicals? Uh, we don't, you know, but here's an example of one we're not worried about. In the tea industry, we're not worried about life below water. That's about oceans and rivers and lakes. And okay, that is critical, but we're not worried about, we are worried about life on land because we get our land, we get our product from the land. Okay, and then finally, one of these things we wanna look at is peace, justice, and strong institutions because we depend on regulators who have real teeth to keep the playing field level so that those who are doing well can be recognized for it and those who are not cannot fake it. And that's a constant issue and it takes strong institutions. So that's my quick take on what sustainability is according to the United Nations for the tea industry. You may have your own take on it, but that's the whole point. This allows a very specific discussion about what's relevant to you and to your business. So now let's take a look about what sustainability is for business in particular, as opposed to the world. Well, this is an effort that's been undertaken by the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board since 2011. 
what they've done is created, they've created a nonprofit organizations that whose goal is to identify the material, the specific factors that are materially important, okay? And by this, I mean, it's very important to 77 different industry sectors. And this is their framework. What they've done is created a universe of sustainability issues. And let's start with the one we're all familiar with, which is the environment. Then they've got social capital and human capital as specific th themes, and then business model and innovation, because we're talking about what's relevant in a business. And a business, uh, you may have an, a business model that's not a good sustainable model, for, okay? And then finally, leadership and governance. So within each of these major categories, they've broken it down into these about 27 uh, specific elements. And then within each of these elements, they've come up with a way to define why are they important? And the first one, they have a five factor test that they call it's material or very important. If it's financially relevant, if it's normative, and that's, in other words, the industry agrees that this is uh, uh, the, the best practice. It's consensus based, not only from people in the industry, but also, for example, universities and academics and regulators, people all agree this is the right thing. It's actionable. It's something you can do things about. I'll give you a ex good example of something that affects all of our sustainability if we're in business, and that's traffic and roads. Drives us crazy, right? We got to get our stuff to market and it's congested, the ports are full. The problem is it's not actionable by a business. We can't do anything about improving the freeways or the trains. So that's not an important factor for us. Finally, open to innovation. Is it something where if we improve it or we make it better, uh, that it'll lead to systemic improvement of the company overall? So within these, this, this sea of, uh, of factors, the Sustainability County Standards Board has created guidance for each of 77 different sectors. Now, why are they doing this? And the reason we're doing this is because our goal is to get this stuff to show up in business financial statements, and that's in profit and loss statements and the balance sheet. So here I've got an example of blowing open a, a P&L statement, profit and loss statement, to show where do we put information about our sustainability performance. So under revenues, okay, well, everybody's got products and they sell them, but how many of those products can be defined as environmentally sustainable? Uh, what about byproducts? I mean, what happens to tea waste? Okay, is there ways we can sell it instead of throwing it away? Uh, recycling, okay, what about packaging from tea? Can it be recycled? And if it's not, what if the number here is zero? We're not making any money from recycling our, our packaging waste. Well, that's, why aren't we do? how come that's zero? We should make money on this. Carbon credits is another source of revenue for organizations that are able to do well. And by the way, one of the things that we're gonna mention as a solution going forward for the tea industry, <clears throat> there's a revolution going on in solar farms and they're starting to put solar panels in agriculture farms with the crops and growing crops under the solar panels where it turns out they do really well because the shade is good for them. It protects them. And why not do this with tea plantations? Turn them into solar tea plantations. Um, then there's free money from grants to do better things and selling renewable energy from those solar panels, for example. And you can do the same thing with expenses and you can do the things with administration costs, et cetera. All of these things can be expanded so that factors that make a business sustainable are visible and financially measured and the bosses can do something practical about it. Just to take a quick look at the balance sheet, here we have assets and liabilities on the asset side. Well, let's say we have a bunch of cars. Well, how many of them use uh, alternative fuels? How many of them are hybrid or electric? If the number is zero, are we gonna keep it there? Is it gonna stay zero? Uh, how about in our buildings? How many of them are certified as being green buildings and have energy efficiency, et cetera? What if the number here again is zero? Don't you wanna make it positive? You don't have any green buildings at all? Shoot, that's something to work on. So this is another way of making sure that we're, our goal all the time is to get the numbers into the financial statements. If they're not there, they cannot be managed. So. 
what is the, from the point of view of business experts, what do they get out of this by doing it this way? Uh, well, the International Federation of Accountants, which is the global ruling body of all accountants, so to speak, has produced a, a book called the Sustainability Framework published in 2015. And it's in your download options that we'll be sending you. We're gonna send you a link and you can click on it and you'll get a zip file. Okay, so they've broken it down into three perspectives, business strategy, operations, and reporting. So I won't go through all of these you know, individually, but I'll mention one or two here. Under business strategy, integration with risk management is really a vital role because we're all getting clobbered by an external risk called pandemic, okay? And it's now made us so aware that if this affects things like our suppliers in, in, in other countries, okay? So supplier engagement and risk management from a business strategy perspective. Now on the operation side, uh, minimizing waste and then uh, understanding your carbon footprint. Remember, if you don't know your carbon footprint, you can't make carbon credit money by reducing it because you can't measure it. You got to start with the numbers. And then on the reporting side, uh, one of the things to understand that we're looking for is uh, making sure that the sustainability is in the financial statements. And we're providing a narrative report for investors and also for lenders and insurers. Because to, from their perspective, if risk management is done well, you can get better rates, perhaps. Think about that. Insurance and, 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 and banking costs everybody and, and your rate depends on your perceived risk. Show them with sustainability management and reporting that you have reduced and are controlling your risks and you may get a better deal. So how do you roll this stuff out? I mean, how does this get implemented? And this is where I'm gonna uh, say, why do we bring this back to the financial side of things? And, and how do we do it in a, in a system of continuous improvement. So first of all, when we talk about continuous improvement, that's the language of quality management. And quality management has always been based around a simple framework of plan, do, check, and act, and then do it again, and just do it again. You're always improving, but it has to be systemic. So as we think about quality management, we wanna think about how do we integrate sustainability into thinking about quality? But at the same time, we have a framework here on financial reporting that makes this really functional. So every year, a business will have to send in its taxes to the government. And here in the United States, uh, April is when they're due. So you got to finish them by the end of March. And so if you're going to finish your financial reports by the end of March, you have to start preparing them in January. And you're taking the end of the year data, wrapping it up, packaging it, getting it all legally reviewed, et cetera. And at that time, you wanna be thinking about teaching the leadership how to create a team to work on sustainability. And as this goes around again, every year, you'll look at the leadership and the team and say, how do we do this better? And the team's first job is to start figuring out what are the materiality factors we need to look for for our business. We're not gonna look for everything. We can't. We can't. We're going to focus on what is important to us in our sector and how do we get right the good guidance from it. Once that's developed, then you start digging into the into the interview. So here we have the five major sustainability issue areas from the SASV. Okay, remember we saw that those five major areas. I put them in here just to show that you know this is sort of around the time you take it. So once you've identified the issues that are important, you start thinking about how to improve it. And that leads to making a draft of a sustainability report. What are we going to do? Because remember, this report is going to go to the bosses at the end of the year where you ask for money. You need a budget to do these things. Uh, so once the draft report is done, just like in auditing and just like in accounting, we do some assurance. And this is the American Institute of CPA, Certified Accountants, has already published guidance on how to do sustainability assurance. This is from the accountants teaching us how to do our job better in this area. So remember, if you think this is all soft and fuzzy, it's not soft and fuzzy to the accountants anymore. That day is gone. And then one so more point I, I want to kind of do one quick note. For those of you that are watching that are in a smaller or even medium-sized business, maybe you're on a large 
uh, corporation yet or not even public yet. And this may seem a little overwhelming. The point of this that's so important is to kind of get your mind in this thought process of thinking about sustainability in a financial way. So when you start to build these really good habits of starting to calculate and have a timeline, when you do decide to raise money or you do decide to start growing down the line, you already have this great behavior and documents kind of started. Absolutely. And if you put this on the table in front of your banker when you're asking for a loan, you will be received better because they will be impressed that you are thinking this through. So uh, now starting in, you know, your, your final phase here, uh, when you start thinking about improving, you have to actually make proposals. So there's you can make proposals to improve inside the company, inside the organization, and also to improve outside. Like, for example, how do you how do you interact with community groups or how do you interact with the government? All right. So all of these things take time and or money, but they all take time and they have to be budgeted. Those budgeted items need to be included in the final sustainability report, which is the recommendation to the leadership. What do we do next year? What are we doing? So thinking of this as a cycle is beneficial uh, on an annual way, because first of all, it stretches the problem out nicely. You're not trying to do everything all at once, which is dry, you know, never works anyway. And it integrates with the way that the finance folks think, because you can set goals for each quarter. You can say, well, okay, did we do this at the end of the quarter? Did we go through our five, uh, five areas by the end of the second quarter? Are we ready with our draft report by the end of the third quarter? Okay, you're timing things to go along with the bankers and the accountants. And then they work with you in a schedule that they can cope with. Okay, so now let's switch to sustainability and the tea industry specifically. I wanna bring this up. I was searching on the internet and found this fun, fun presentation by National Geographic. It was uh, funded by um, Unilever and Lipton Tea. Uh, but just look up sustainability, the exact word, and you'll be able to see a, a really neat multimedia presentation series on sustainability in the tea business. So the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, I mentioned, I just to say a few words about this because it's important to know who they are and what they're not. So again, I'm going to say what they're focused on is accounting for what? How do we narrow sustainability down to be practical? Because I'm worried about different things than you are. Okay, so they were founded in 2011 to create harmonized metrics. Okay, in other words, everybody can use the same metrics that conform to the SEC's Security Exchange Commission definition of materiality as reported in legally required documents. So the 10K is the, man, is, is the uh, explanation of financial results. MD&A is management discussion and analysis. It's more of a, a narrative, a story about what's going on. And uh, again, it, it, a topic is material if its absence would potentially change the decisions of an investor. If a, if a metric is material, you must tell it to the investors. In other words, what they're trying to prevent is investors being screwed when a company does not tell them an important or material fact that they should have known and that would have changed their, 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 their idea or their investment. Now, SASB is not an accountancy organization. It's private, it's nonprofit, uh, and it's not regulated, but its recommendations are used by thousands of companies now, and especially by the sustainability leaders out there like Unilever. Unilever uses these metrics. Okay, and again, the metrics are sector specific, so you can compare competitors. I don't want to compare a T company to Ford Motor. That's ridiculous. Which one is more sustainable? That's a silly question. I want to compare a T company to another T company. Okay, so we're, they've done this for 77 sectors, and we're going to show you how to find them for the T business. <clears throat> so SASB has created a materiality map which is available online, it's free to use. And this is how it looks. What they've done is they've divided the world of industry up into these major sectors. I haven't got them all here, but there's a bunch of them. And, and then they've over here, they've got all of those sustainability categories that we talked about earlier. These are the five major topics. And over here are their subtopics. So what they've done is they've made uh, 
a, a matrix that shows for a given sector, what are the important topics that they should be worrying about? So let's look at food and beverage, which is tea. Tea is a beverage in the beverage sector, all right? So in general, in the food and beverage sector, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are important, but air quality is typically not a major issue for individual businesses. If you're, you know, you're not making chemicals and emitting chemicals into the air typically, for example. Uh, energy and water are important and ecological impacts are important, but customer privacy is typically not a major issue for the food and beverage sector. We're not trying to take so many data. Well, some people are now. Okay. Uh, and then looking along here, product quality and safety, yes. Customer welfare, yes. Selling practices and labeling, yes. Um, employee engagement and diversity inclusion, typically not a critical business issue, at least according to this group, SASME, all right? You may disagree. So let's see what happens when we take a look at opening up the food and beverage sector. So when I click on one of these boxes on this web page, it opens up and here are the subsectors in food and beverage. And there are two of them that are directly relevant, non-alcoholic beverage, including tea and coffee, and also agriculture products. And so if you click on one of these boxes and that's not live now, but here, so here we see selling practices and product labeling are important in the non-alcoholic beverage industry. And they're very important. Obviously it's a consumer facing business where quality is regulated and certified. Okay, so now if I go and I click on that box, this is what I see. I see accounting metrics for selling practices and product labeling that include a uh, percentage of advertising impressions made on children. In other words, you're trying to find out, are you, are you promoting your product to kids? And if so, that's an issue. Now in T, we're not so concerned. Uh, uh, what is the revenue from products labeled as containing genetically modified organisms? Is it 100%? Is it 0%? If you have, do you have GMO tea? I don't know, Jeffrey, is there such thing as GMO tea now these days? Don't answer that yet. Uh, uh, number of incidents of non-compliance. So here we see that this is actually one of five major categories and eight subcategories. So and as I click through there, there they all are. These are the, 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 the measurable business factors that a tea company should be thinking about when they're preparing an assessment of their own sustainability and a report. So here are all of the standards for the non-alcoholic beverages sector. So we see fleet fuel and management, energy management, water, health and nutrition, labeling and marketing, packaging, life cycle management, and environmental and social impacts of the ingredient supply chain. And then on the ingredient sourcing. So again, in each one of these boxes, they have detailed measurement guidance on how do you how do you measure it and how do you report it. So when you get these standards, you can get them for free from the SASB website. And the the download for the SASB standard on accounting, I mean, I'm sorry, on now alcohol of beverages. This is a 257 page document. There's a lot going on in here and you can learn a tremendous amount about it. And I wanna point out that they do this for 77 different sectors. If you wanna learn about um, the mining business or heavy manufacturing, you can get standards for these guys from this organization. And it's an introduction to the industry that's amazing and it's all free. So you can quickly become an expert in advising any company in any sector how to be more sustainable because now you know where to go get the reference material. So to use it, you study the SASB website. It's got some good videos. Find your client's sustainability sector. Download the standards for those sectors. And now you can start adding to it. So there's another organization that's been producing standards for sectors on sustainability since 2000. And it's a, this is the Global Reporting Initiative. It's called, and it's a global nonprofit and it produces some generic and some sector sustainability standards. They were founded because in the by the end of the 1990s, many, many companies were pr producing, public companies in particular, were producing uh, reports on their social responsibility. They weren't calling it sustainability quite then yet producing reports on their responsibility. And they were getting 
questions from so many different environmental and social groups saying, we want to know all about this. And, we, and it was, they said, we're suffering from reporting fatigue. We have to write reports for everybody and everyone's different and they all want different information. And, this, and at the same time, on the other side, investors were going crazy with this too. They say, I can't compare these two companies. They're reporting on different things. You know, they're like, here's, here's one tea company and another tea company. Uh, you know, one's reporting this and that, the other one's reporting something else. I can't compare them on this. So it was investor demand that said, we need generic global standards that everybody can follow. It was the, it was the people with the money asking for this. So uh, it has become the most widely used system of sustainability metrics in the world. So uh, basically most of the world's biggest companies are using the GRI standards already. And now they're using the SASB standards also. So this is best practices. And it's informed by and relevant to a very wide variety. It wasn't meant to be just business specific. Governments use it, nonprofits use it. They're partnered with the United Nations Environment Program. Um, and so their concept of, set, of standards is much broader than SASB's is. So the GRI worries about standards that are relevant to regulators and to communities. They're not saying, what's, is it important to the business? That Sure, it needs to be important to business, but it's important to other people as well, even if the company doesn't like that. <laughs> so what they've done is over the years, they've been collecting uh, published reports from companies about their sustainability. And they've now created the Sustainability Disclosure Database, which is searchable by sector and country and more. And uh, before I jump into it, I just want to mention that this is, uh, they have three universal standards that cover um, the foundations of organizations and then general contextual information. You know, for example, how does a company report its revenues? Do they do it differently than another? So you need to have these standards to, to make them comparable. Uh, and then they have management tools, but then they've broken it out into environment, economical, and social standards. And then they have business sector specific standards. Okay, so moving right along, again, you only use the standards that are relevant to you. You don't have to use all of them. <clears throat> and when you do use them, you can repair, produce a report and you can publish it in the sustainability disclosure database. Here, what I've done is I've done a search for T and I've done, and I've selected two sectors, agriculture and food and beverage products. I didn't bother with a uh, country or region, but I could. And doing that, I found 25 reports from eight different organizations. And if we look down here, uh, there, here's a, a Ceylonese, a, a Ceylon, Sri Lanka plantation, Boosted plantations, s and coffee and tea, Taiwan tea, Tata tea, okay? So these over here are the dates that these pub reports were published. And I can click on them and I'm gonna click on uh, s and coffee and tea and I can download the report right there. It pops right up. So this is their 2017 report, and they've got a 2019 report too, of course. Uh, but this is important because I want to show you the table of contents. Um, they talk about their vision. They talk about now, and, and then they get very specific. Workplace responsibility, corporate citizenship, sourcing, the impact of their programs. And then they have a case study of tea in Argentina. Then they provide more performance data. And they talk about their environmental conservation ethic. Uh, this is about an 80 page report. And so here, what they've done is they've put their performance data here for a, a South American program, they call it RAIS. And what they're doing showing is the metrics, measurable data that can be checked and accounted for, all right? That shows their performance on various factors that are important to them. So some of these things, they seem to be, uh, you know, these are important. Like here's here on a social factor, 99% of their farmers experience food security issues. 3% uh, of the water and soil conservation practices have been adopted. Okay, well, boy, that's an actionable item we want to get on, right? I mean, we're not succeeding. And over here, they're still suffering. So 99% uh, of them though are avoiding at deforestation as much as possible. So that's a consciousness that they have achieved because they've been educated. 
the thing that I want to emphasize is these guys have gotten very specific and they're putting hard numbers on it so they can see how well they're doing. And all these other companies have done the same thing. Now, I'm going to show you a magic trick on how to find T solutions that nobody else remembers how to do. So back in the 1990s in the U.S. and, and, and in Europe, um, the focus of environmental agencies became how to help business prevent waste and pollution rather than manage it at the end of the pipe. Because can good practices make this go away instead of costing lots of, instead of, you know, paying lots, lots of money to treat and dispose things. And in North America, the US EPA came up with the phrase pollution prevention. And they announced that in 1990. And now in almost every state of the country, except Alaska, uh, there are pollution prevention programs in the state environmental agencies. And they've been helping business for 25 years to reduce waste and to be more sustainable. And they help them with both re regulation and assistance. And this phrase pollution prevention is used in the United States and in Canada. Now the same concept of helping business to reduce waste and produce was developed by the United Nations at the same time. And they call it cleaner production as in making things in a cleaner and more sustainable way. And the UN is everywhere. So this is the way the rest of the world that's not North America talks about this, this issue. And there's programs, there's official seat cleaner production programs in 48 countries. And a lot of their focus is on technology transfer because the UN works with poor countries. So they wanna know the best practices. So this is solutions from everywhere but North America, but let me show you what happens as a consequence. So here, what I've done is, okay, I want to find about solutions for tea industry. I need to use both phrases. I'm going to start by doing a search for pollution prevention and tea. And I get 1.9 million results. And the first one is about how is Bigelow Tea being a pollution prevention champion? And here's a story about uh, how to reduce sludge from processing oolong tea water waste. Uh, and uh, here's how uh, another organization do it. Well, it's not a tea company. Okay. But the point is that there's a lot of information here. Now I did the same search over here with cleaner production and tea and I got 828,000 results. And it's also about tea industry. Here's a cleaner production system for tea processing. Cradle to grave economic analysis of tea life. Uh, clean production and profitability in tea factories in Rwanda. 800,000 results that are helpful. And they're all completely different from the results over here, even though the underlying concepts are exactly the same. And if I search for sustainability in tea, I'd get one third as much. And it wouldn't probably be very technical. This is technical solutions that your company and your farmers and your suppliers can use. So always remember to search for your sector, which is tea industry, or it might be coffee, and this brackets and pollution prevention or cleaner production. That way you get the combination results. We'd get one, two, 2.8 million hits if we do it the right way using the magic words, pollution prevention and cleaner production. And here's the thing, you would never know any of these articles exist if you didn't know to use those particular funny words, which are no longer used because the programs are all, the EPA and the UN changed their program language. So I've been doing this business for 25 years and I've worked in both of these set in, in both the, with the UN and the US EPA. I know where all this stuff is, but it's been forgotten by the vast majority of people out there. And it's a hidden world of solutions. Okay, so uh, getting back to implementation, I'm gonna do a very quick pass through on how to get this done. And the first thing is to remember, we're gonna do a plan, do, check, act cycle. And, and then we do it again. And so on the planning side, we have to come up with our materiality list. This is a good example of how one company, a global water treatment company, has arranged its sustainability issues based on potential business impact and stakeholder interest from low to high and low to high. And so this is a great visual way for your company and your readers to see how you prioritize these different factors. So it's a water company, so water for sure, but it's also greenhouse gas because water treatment has a huge effect on greenhouse gases. 
and land and biodiversity are affected by clean water. Um, indigenous peoples, okay, they're affected by water use and by water pollution. And over here, things like product safety and human rights, et cetera, they're not as strategically important. These things won't break your business. These things can, because they're really important to stakeholders and they have high impact. So it's a great visual that I like to recommend. And again, you want to do this by finding the SASB sector standards, find the GRI standards that go along with it. Look at the published sustainability reports for your sector, which is T, but it could be it could be cars. And then list the issues and then assess their impact and, and, and interest. Okay, on the do side, here's a very simple matrix of just checklist. Of, here are the five SASB sustainability areas. For each one, you need to know what's the process, what's going on. What, what is actually happening? Go describe the processes that are affected. Uh, do data validation. Uh, make sure the data you have is correct because often it may not be. I could tell stories about that all day long. Uh, material metrics, make sure you find that set of them. And, and remember for the whole food and beverage sector, they only came up with 20 metrics. There's not thousands of them. And then you wanna do a cost and risk assessment and then innovate and estimate. How is this gonna help you? So this is just a very simple organizational approach. And I'm gonna say a little bit about capital investment, but not much, I don't have time actually, but a thing that I wanna recommend that you think about is that when you're looking at making an investment of an alternative, the first thing is do nothing. Okay, we're gonna keep doing the same thing we're gonna do, but this is gonna to have to be explained in the form of a budget forecast. And then we'll have maybe two alternatives. So what we want to be understanding is that when an alternative is more sustainable, what does that mean? It has less risk. And if it uses, if it has less risk and we're using net present value and discounted cash flow, which you should be doing, well, lower risk means you need to give it a lower discount rate. Because what that does is it means the savings in the future are worth more because they're not discounted as much. And we know that the riskier the investment, the more discount you have to give it, okay? It gets a, okay? If you wanna get high returns, you gotta take high risk. At the same time, if you want no risk, you don't get a high rate. Well, sustainability reduces risk. And if you treat it as the same risk in a financial analysis as the do nothing alternative, you're actually undervaluing the sustainability investment you're actually going to have a chance of turning down something that actually is the financially right decision. So we've got some documents to help you with that. Uh, it's worth an entire webinar, but it's not hard to get the basic points uh, understood for anybody that's familiar with any kind of financial analysis. So financial reporting by pu in public, um, I've mentioned one in particular, the GRI Sustainability Disclosure Database. There's two others, the corporateregister.com and sustainability-reports.com. Between these three, I would search all of them. So I did not search corporate register and sustainable report for the tea industry, but they do have reports. I do know that. I just didn't dig them all up. Um, public reporting is a, a specific issue in itself because there are legal implications to what you say. And I won't go into them now because most of you are not trying to do that. But private reporting is really important. The first one is employing to your employees. They want to know: Are we doing good things? Are you know? Are we helping the the world? Now you can see using these standards how you can say this is what we're doing, and we know we're doing the right thing because this is a standard for the whole sector that was developed with sector participants. You can talk to investors and to lenders and to insurers as well because you're focused on reducing risk and improving performance. And you're also focused on learning from others to get the best practices. You're learning how to innovate. And again, I'm gonna just say lenders and insurers, do this well, get a good report, show results, and then argue to your banker and to your insurance company that you deserve better treatment because you are lower risk than the other guys. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. And uh, we're gonna let you use the Zoom box, the Zoom chat box to ask questions. And then to follow up and to request a copy of this webinar, a PDF. So we'll just email you this PDF. So you don't have to take any notes. 
Uh, but you need to contact Jeffrey and ask him for it and he'll send it to you. And I know that you'll have other questions because he'll have a lot more to say. So I wanna sign off and say, thank you very much. My website is sustainabilitycpe.com. Uh, there's my email address. And if anybody is uh, interested to follow up, I welcome, uh, welcome it, uh, getting in touch. Thanks very much. And thanks for this opportunity, Jeffrey. And Bert, one more thing while you're still here, we do have one question that um, I want to actually direct towards you. If you, I, I don't know how to answer this, but maybe you will. Um, it's a particular subject. Um, so the state of California requires a transparency of human trafficking and slavery in supply chain reporting for large companies. Reporting has been weak and insufficient, especially for the tea industry. Have you seen any real efforts of including human trafficking and indentured labor in their sustainable management cycles? I have not spent my time studying the tea industry, and this was a new opportunity for me. So I don't, I haven't gone into detail on it, but it would be very little effort because those factors are in, included in both the GRI and the SASB published standards. And so the companies in the tea industry are, that have published reports about that are definitely addressing it. And I think that there's gonna be more and more attention and it's simply because the internet is making it very hard to hide bad behavior. And, uh, and it, you know, you can, uh, any, any business can suddenly become the focus of attention of tens of millions of people who are looking for a microscope to look up the backside of the business. Sure. So uh, you do not want to trigger these things. The best thing to do is to get ahead of it and to be talking to your suppliers and say, this is important. Um, when the first environmental management system standards came out in the night around 1990, they were quickly adopted by the big four car companies. And then they turned around to their suppliers and said, if you want to remain a supplier, you will get certified. And we are going to make that a requirement. And we're going to give you five years. But after five years, if you do not meet the ISO standards for quality management, you're out. Well, the key thing is that they did give the suppliers time and they gave them a huge amount of help. There wasn't just an order and hands off. They worked with them very closely. And as a result, they got huge improvements in quality because they stopped, for example, uh, buying so much paint that had particularly bad components in it, chemical, chemicals in paint for cars that were highly regulated. And they said, geez, this is getting us into trouble with our waste disposal. So they worked with the suppliers to reformulate the paint. They would not have done it if it wasn't because disposal of the paint waste was becoming very expensive. Sure. So, so the short answer is it is happening with human rights in the, in the tea supply chain, uh, but it takes that kind of collaborative effort. You don't get there by giving people orders. You get there by working with them and realizing that for them, it's a challenge too. Nobody yeah. does human rights violations really for fun. Let's be clear, they, they, they'd rather not. <laughs> well, thank you for answering that. I wanted to catch you on that right before you left. Um, and I know we're at an hour now. Um, that's what we said we were gonna have this webinar for. So I will extend the invitation to those yep, <laughs> that you're still interested in. Um, I will do a, maybe a five, 10 minute wrap up on how this can be applied on a very, very, very small level. Maybe you're a very small company, you're just building some teas in China, um, and I'm gonna share with that. So once again, thank you, Bert, for joining us and being a part of that, I do appreciate your time. Um, so those of you that are still with us, if you have questions, feel free to kind of toss them in now. And I'm gonna share a little bit of my experience um, on how this can affect sustainability and the quality of your product on a very, very small scale. So many of you are familiar with the tea industry. I've had multiple tea companies and my most recent company was the most educational for me. I learned a lot and that was tea book. And my goal was to get clean, affordable and tasty tea. Um, yeah, Bert's talking some stuff in the chat box too. Um, to get clean, affordable, tasty tea to the marketplace. And so I had my own assumptions about how I was going to do that um, with different marketing and how you approach that. But one thing that really helped me was I saw a lot of tea companies would have these extensive menus, right? 100 offerings, 50 tea offerings, 30 different tea varietals. And so you have to think about from a small company standpoint and, and a su supply chain standpoint, what is the likelihood that a small company is going to be able to keep in stock 50 plus tea varietals and ensure they're of the highest quality and freshest. That'll be very difficult to do. 
And one thing a lot of people don't know about the tea industry is if you're a small company, it actually can be quite easy to get in contact with an import exporter. So let's say I'm an individual, I want to start a company. There are hundreds, thousands on LinkedIn, Alibaba, WeChat, social media, Facebook, of all these import exporters that will happily send you beautiful catalogs. And all you have to do as a tea company is to say, oh, I want this tea name at this price. And we don't really think about the indirect consequences of that business relationship. Tea is a very much an agricultural product. And so usually there is a farmer, there is a distributor that's usually located in the country of origin that works with those farmers, because maybe those farmers have difficulty with business and purchases tea. And then there is an import exporter. And the import exporter is usually a larger company that has all the required licenses of importing and exporting. Um, and what they do is they produce these beautiful catalogs of names and prices. So any small company can go to that import exporter and say, oh, I want Taiwan Yin from the most famous region in China. And I want to pay $25. And what's the import exporter going to do? They're going to say, okay, we can do that. And then they go to their distributors and the distributors, well, there's no way we're going to get you authentic table in at that price point. And the import exporter, most of the time, does not care. They just need a tea that is like table in at that price point. That's the goal. They need to sell to the customer. And so then maybe sometimes the distributors, because they want to get this contract, they want to make money, right? Because they're detached from the consumer network. They go to the farmers and they go to an unfamous region, maybe not in Anxi, and they produce a tea that's resemble that of Taiwan Yin. And they can get it to a very, very low price, get to the import export, and then sell to the consumer or the small business. And then what happens when the small business sells a tea that says it's from Taiwan famous Lishan or Taiwan Yin or famous mountain poor tea at this price point, and they're selling to the customers. What if the information they got along that trail was incorrect? And now they're telling their customers that information. Who's at fault there? And so I realized this was a big, seriously problem because a lot of people in the tea industry, we have a disconnect about famous mountain tea and the likelihood, the realistic likelihood of what we're drinking is indeed where it is said it's from. What is the likelihood of this being actually authentic? Or is it just being from an import exporter that was shipped and had a beautiful catalog? So why do so many small businesses usually work with import exporters? Well, they provide beautiful marketing material, all the catalogs and all the names and all the prices you could ever want. And when you have to deal with a distributor, you're going to start to move on to the cultural side. And you also notice I have a lot of experience with cultural liaison. What that means is I help understand different cultures and cultures and help them work together with building supply chain. So a good example is my relationship with Mr. Duan. He was in Hunan. And I knew it was very, very important if I was going to achieve my goal of clean, affordable, and tasty, I couldn't go through the route of an import exporter because there's no accountability. There's no regulations to the quality of the product I was bringing in. So I needed to develop my own supply chain, which believe it or not, guess what? You develop your own supply chain with a distributor or farmer, you all of a sudden have reduced your risk greatly because now you're building something else outside that's fully in your control. So that's the first thing we started to do is I worked with Mr. Duan in Hunan and I didn't want to source teas from seven different provinces because you have the shipping and shipping them and packaging them and where we're going to get the packaging done. One, extremely costly. And being able to get that sort of transparency and quality would be almost impossible without a tremendous amount of capital. So I said, Duan was a really honest guy, had high integrity. But in order to build a relationship with a distributor and a small business, they're not just going to give you 100% of their effort to help you, right? Because it has to be a mutual incentive. So I have to have a strong interest in this foreign supplier's success. So I also need to invest my time, my energy, my knowledge, sometimes my resources to build that relationship with Mr. Duong. And so what we did was I flew out to China, he flew out to Seattle. We talked, I talked about my vision, what my company is, why I wanted him to be a part of it. And he could kind of believe into that, build into that. And so what we started to do was I said, Let's just get teas from Hunan. It's not a famous area. Not a lot of people know about it. And we started to get samples of teas I liked, maybe Taiwan oolongs or white teas or green teas or black teas. And he had very strong relationships with farmers. 
And so in return, he wants to work with these farmers, teach them about how not to use pesticides, how to make more clean produced teas at higher elevations, and how to produce an oolong, or how to produce a white tea, how to produce a black tea. So we had a very tight controlled supply chain, but the quality went way up. And since it wasn't a famous region, I wasn't trying to chase after these famous mountain teas, which in reality would be a very low percent chance that I actually might get authentic famous mountain teas. And also 100 other companies are also trying to get famous mountain teas when there was a very established, wealthy and educated market in Asia actively buying those teas, right? So we also have come to the reality of that marketplace. By developing my own marketplace and partnership with Mr. Duan, I increased the quality of my tea, I lowered my cost, I lowered my risk, and I have this partnership now that also is an asset. It's also very valuable. And I can build on that. We can negotiate. I can tweak products. I can improve a product. I can change a product. We can work with different farmers. And there's a mutual interest. And this is why sometimes a lot of small companies don't want to work with a distributor. they rather work with an import-exporter because wouldn't it be nice just to get a big old catalog and just say a name of a famous mountain tea and the price point you want to pay and it gets delivered at your doorstep a month later? Sure, everyone would like that. But we don't actually know what the consequences of that actually is. Yes, it's easier. But if you go to the distributor, you have to deal with another culture, which is very difficult. Yes, you're going to have to deal with the different types of ways they communicate. Maybe their English isn't as good. So there's more reason and time you have to invest. But I can guarantee the reward, the result of building that relationship will outweigh any of the effort you have to put in and ultimately make your business more sustainable. It's your own supply chain and you can lower the cost. We had one shipping route instead of five different provinces shipping tea to a hub in Hunan and then sending it back to the US. So just kind of reducing that footprint increased the quality, it lowered the price and it lowered the risk. Um, and then when I got into something different, when I worked with Denong, I learned something very unique was there are certain types of tea Taiwanese high mountain oolong, and also poor, which is a little bit more difficult to build that kind of supply chain as a small business. But we can learn a lot from those privatized businesses. A lot of the very premium poor companies, if you look at these gardens, like hundreds of years old, these tea trees, they usually owned or leased the land. There's a proprietary source. And when there's a proprietary source of these old tea trees, these are trees that have been growing naturally without human intervention. It's a very, very self-sustaining ecosystem, which allowed these to achieve very, very high grade certifications, SGS, ISO. Um, and they usually will control that raw material. And so that can be a little bit hard or intimidating as a small business. And that's where you also need to spend time to learn about the economics and the quality of the tea, really understand why is this mountain or that raw material more expensive than this mountain or that raw material? Don't just say, oh, that's cheaper, let's go there. Really understand why is it more expensive? Why is someone willing to spend $500 for a tea cake? Why are there auctions in Hong Kong where a poor tea cake is being sold for tens of thousands of dollars, yet you can find a 1980s cake that was sold at the auction for tens of thousands of dollars. You can go online and find a tea cake that's labeled 1980s, that's selling for 100. We need to understand why, especially as businesses, why is there a price difference and understand the quality of the raw material. And once you understand more of that, you'll be more cautious when making deals and buying products from people that you don't know the source and be more encouraged to develop your own supply chain, which can then turn into your own raw material base down the road as you grow and be another incredible asset and part of the company. Um, so I just kind of wanted to share with the, that kind of experience with you, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, if you want to reach out or kind of reach out anytime, you can always reach me at my email, jeffreymackintosh at gmail. Um, and once again, I just want to thank you all so much for joining this webinar, and we look forward to talking to you more. Let us know a review, and of course, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to both of us. So thank you all so much. And have a great rest of your Sunday. And thanks again, Bert. If you're still there, I really appreciate that.